So now we move to a panel which, building on the Secretary of State's speech, will actually move us from being good, because we are a good nation in terms of our hospitality and tourism products. We're a fantastic nation. I can see our guests from China nodding very well, Madame Yu. Um, but there is obviously more potential to move to being great. And to lead this session, please welcome the Chief Executive of London and Partners, Gordon Innes. <laughs> Thank you very much, Shufi. Um, we are running a bit late, so, um, and I don't want to keep you too long away from a great Interconti lunch, um, but I will ask um, Ufi perhaps to let me know when, uh, it's, when we've overrun too far. So, um, in the meantime, perhaps I could ask my uh, panelists to come up onto the stage, um, and I'll very quickly introduce them as they're doing so. Um, so, Lord Lee of Trafford, uh, uh, the Chairman of the All-Party Parliamentary Group for Tourism, former Minister for Tourism, uh, Chairman of ALVA, um, a number of non-executive director and chairman roles amongst many others, I could go on. Uh, Lord Tim Clement-Jones, uh, the London Managing Partner for DLA Piper, one of the sponsors today, one of the world's largest law firms. Uh, was Lib Dem spokesman for culture, media and sport, uh, is a trustee of the Barbican amongst, uh, again, uh, a long list of other achievements that I could, I could mention. Uh, Dermot King, who's the director of Bourne Leisure, um, also the managing director of Butlins, uh, one of the uh, four best companies in the UK to work for, um, over a billion pounds of sales, uh, employing more than 12,500 people, um, and with 25 years' experience in the industry. Uh, and finally, James Beresford, the chief executive of Visit England, uh, formerly the Heart of England Tourist Board, the Northwest Development Agency, um, and a director of the Liverpool Institute for Performing Arts. So very warm welcome. Um, I don't bite Tim. It's, it's <laughs> I'd like to come and sit a bit closer. <laughs> um, today's panel, we've, we've heard the macro piece. We've heard what's happening internationally. We've heard about uh, what's happening in the industry and uh, what's happening with some of our competitor nations. Uh, this panel is about moving from good to great, about strategies for moving to good, from good to great. Um, James, if I can start with you and then perhaps move on to Dermot, what does great look like? What would we need to do to move from good to great? Well, I'm not sure you should set a bar and say that's what great looks like because it's a continually moving picture. Um, and I'd like to take a leaf out of Jim's book from TNS because I think great can only really be set by the customer, by the user, by the visitor. And I think we should listen to and aspire to that which the consumer wants because great next year won't be the same as great in 2017, 2018. Having said that, in making a stab at what great might look like, I think it is, again, taking a, a leaf out of one of our earlier commentators from, from, from Richard earlier on, it's about great experiences. And I don't think it's just about the great experience that is in any part of the attraction or the hotel or the pub. It's a collective experience. I think when a visitor, be a domestic, or international goes to a destination, goes somewhere, they want a great experience from the pub to the transport, to the attraction, to the welcome to the hotel. And I think, as an industry, we have to move towards a collective approach to great experiences. And Dermot, you've, you, you give great experiences. You've grown profits in the company by, what, 58% in the last few years. What Organic. does great mean for, for, for Butlins? What does great mean for Bourne? Well, um, I'm an operator, obviously, um, and from an operational point of view, I don't look back. I only see the things that we haven't done rather than the things that we have done. Um, I don't keep seeing greatness as being what we've achieved. I see opportunities around what we haven't achieved yet, and I see that greatness are, is in the things that we have yet to do, and I think what we, what we hope to move on to talk about is how does government create an environment where businesses can be great? Because I think that's the key. Okay. And, and, and on that point, th this feels a bit like a tipping point for the industry, that we've seen huge investment over the last few years, particularly in London, in the city I promote. Uh, we've seen the, the fantastic showcase Lon uh, that London and the country put on last year. Uh, if, you, if you ask the Tourism Alliance, they would say that, that 
the, the, this is both an opportunity and a threat, that if we don't get the support, if we don't get our act together, if government doesn't come in behind us, that, that we will lose this great opportunity. Lord, Lord Lee, is, is government complacent or is, is government a, an advocate and supporter? Government basically hasn't got the message. Uh, if I can put it very simply to you, tourism is, is, and I've said this in the House of Lords and elsewhere, tourism is the number one industry in more parliamentary constituencies than any other single industry. But you wouldn't think so from the way government actually treats the industry and regards the industry. And I'm not talking about this particular government and this particular coalition. It goes back many, 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 many years. The last election, the manifestos of all three major parties, tourism wasn't mentioned at all. There wasn't one word on tourism. We have no tourism in the title of DCMS. The chairman of Visit Britain, who I'm glad to say is still with us, Chris Rodriguez, his job spec is six day, roughly six days a month. He does a lot more than that. How can you carry the banner for this country abroad, all over the world, and fulfill the role in this country six days a month? Government just hasn't got the message. The power in this government, in all governments, is the axis between the Prime Minister and the Chancellor the Exchequer. And that's where we have got to get that message through. Secretary of States try, they come and go. Minister of Tourism, I know, come and go. At the end of the day, unless we get the message to the top, to that axis where power really lies, we ain't going to get any significant change in the government's attitude to this particular industry. Tim, you, you, you set up the Public Affairs Group at, at DLA at the same time I did the same at, at Lovells. What, um, what will it take to achieve what Lord Lee just described? Well, I think one might just draw a few lessons from the creative industries. They are just a little bit ahead of the curve for various reasons. They've gained slightly more recognition quite a bit more recognition than the hospitality and tourism industry. They've got themselves, and they got it fairly early on in this government, they got a Creative Industries Council. That is looking at the issues of financing, deregulation, uh, uh, skills, uh, a whole series of, of, uh, of issues that, as John says, can only be solved across government. I mean, there are two real challenges here. There's the internal joining up of government between different government departments, and there are the external joining up with the industry. So uh, a, 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 a hospitality and tourism council, for instance, uh, set up with the industry would do that external job, but there's still the issue of joining up with the Treasury and so on, as John says. Because at the moment, uh, uh, what we're finding is that government policies are militating against the competitiveness of our tourism and hospitality industry. I mean, the Secretary of State used the word competitiveness herself, but as, as we've heard from many speakers this morning, APD, visas, uh, uh, VAT, uh, you name it, they are militating against our future competitiveness. However good our brand, if you don't uh, uh, get the conditions right of, uh, uh, of your competitive situation, you're not gonna be successful in the future. And, and, and the Secretary... The, the Secretary of State talked about the, the economic case and the role uh, not only of data but, but in, in, in arguing the case. Uh, we haven't heard this morning about the role that the tourism industry provides in supporting manufacturing. We haven't heard about uh, the opportunities for international supply chains. We heard a little bit about exports from an economist first thing this morning. Are we as an industry making that case effectively? Or are we just throwing out lots of data and hoping some of it will stick? Well, I think some of the Oxford uh, analysis uh, Oxford economics analysis is extremely good. But I think we can go wider. I think you're right. I mean, the Secretary of State herself made the point about the joining up uh, between the cultural industries, creative industries, and tourism. And of course, you know, we know and we've seen that TEBR report that was done for the Arts Council very recently, which I think, you know, speaks volumes about that. But let's see an equivalent for manufacturing, uh, as you say, Gordon. Let's see other sectors and how they plug into our tourism tourism and hospitality industry. Uh, I mean, I know, uh, as a lawyer, real estate is a fundamental part of delivering the tourism and hospitality uh, uh, agenda. So, you know, let's see what the economic impact of that is. Gordon, can I pick up the point Please. of manufacturing, if I, yeah. uh, if I may? Because I think this is, this is an argument that isn't actually uh, pursued as, uh, as it should by the industry. There is a complementary relationship 
between a, a service industry like tourism and, and manufacturing. Specifically, I remember in the 1980s, <coughs> excuse me, when I was tourism minister, we calculated then, or the industry calculated for me, that 80% uh, of, of a new UK hotel actually was of UK manufactured origin. And it'd be interesting to know whether there'd been any significant change in that. My guess is there wouldn't. So new hotels, luxury hotels, budget hotels, help manufacturing industry. I remember in, in the 1980s, the, the biggest steel contract was actually uh, at Blackpool Pleasure Beach in the new big one, the new big ride that they were constructing at that stage. That was the biggest contract. And take our aerospace industry, where, where we actually have a world position, uh, a world leading position, at least we can hold our own in that industry, there is a, a, an obvious relationship between travel and tourism and a healthy and prosperous aerospace industry. So there's a complementary relationship between healthy service industry like tourism uh, and, and manufacturing. And that is a case that I would suggest isn't actually pushed anything like strongly enough. And uh, Gordon, Gordon, you said, have we produced the evidence? In, at least in relation to one area, which is the question of VAT, uh, we have produced the evidence. In fact, uh, n it's not us that's produced the evidence. It's, it's uh, expert economists who produce the evidence. And it's not even me that's saying it, not even my expert economists who are saying it. It's the government's own economic advisor is saying that if you give tourism a chance to compete in Europe with... Spain, Italy, Germany, France, you will generate a lowering of the number of jobs that we are effectively um, uh, exporting to France and those countries. Um, if you go back to the things that we've been saying in the reports that we've been producing for government, the evidence is very clear. In fact, it is, it is so clear it's a no-brainer. In fact, it's such a no-brainer you would need no brain not to implement it. <laughs> and it seems to me, as it's not been implemented, you can draw your own conclusions. It's, 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 it's a national scandal that UK families are being taxed more to stay at home on holidays than to go abroad to France. And somebody needs to make the point and make the point clearly. And if government isn't listening, whose fault is that? And whose fault is it? Of course, it's all of our faults. Everybody in the room it's our fault because we haven't made government listen. And, and on that point, so we, we've heard the, the importance, the access between number 10 and the Treasury, something we're all very familiar with, the possibility of perhaps a, a, a quad bringing in. Uh, there's a number of quads that operate in the coalition government and, um, um, in terms of getting decisions made. We, uh, the issue of tax, we heard this morning more about uh, issues of infrastructure, of skills development, the role that government can play there. But, Practical, we need to make the case, but what practical things do you want from government? Don't you just want government to, to clear the blockages and to get out of the way, to allow you to create more businesses to, for entrepreneurs to come forward and to succeed? What, what's the, some practical things, Dermot? Yeah. I say that the role of government... Go, government is not going to get the economy growing. Um, that it isn't going to happen. Private businesses are going to get the economy growing. Private businesses are going to employ people. There are a million young people unemployed at the moment. Which industry is best placed to employ those people? Well, it's not financial services, and it's not the petrochemical industry. It's the tourist industry that's going to get those people back to work. What government needs to do is create an environment where entrepreneurs can be successful by growing their profits by employ and employing more people as a result. We're lucky at that last uh, discussion point on, on uh, internet. We are lucky. We are very lucky because we don't face any competition from the internet. You, have, you actually have to go to North Wales to experience a holiday in North Wales. You can't take a virtual holiday. Um, we are very, very lucky in that score. And the only way we can grow, uh, if we're allowed to grow our industry, we will employ more people. We will create uh, growth in the economy as a result with the third, already the third biggest export earner for UK economy. Uh, and if you want to know what needs to be done, take a look at the evidence. We are 135th out of 138 countries in terms of uh, price competitiveness. Uh, we have uh, had a negative balance of payments for the last 30 years. We haven't had a positive balance of tourism payments since 1985. Uh, we are 
uh, managed by probably the most juniorest rank in, in, in government, um, and it's the third biggest industry. You know, would, would Alan Sugar give his third biggest business to the person who won, who won uh, uh, Apprentice last year? I don't think he would. Uh, and, we're tr and we're in DCMS. We're not even treated as an industry. We're not even in, within business. And, and these are the issues that we need government to face up to because this is the industry can, that can get the economy moving. Tim, are there some easy wins here from, from, uh, in terms of symbolic actions that government could take or the industry could take? Well, uh, I think setting up a, a, a hospitality and tourism council would at least demonstrate commitment. Um, uh, obviously, there are going to be uh, other government departments not included uh, that are going to be outside the council to start with. It's going to start with, it would start with biz and DCMS, obviously. But, uh, uh, and so you wouldn't be able to deal with a whole range of things. But there are some easy conversations one can have with the Treasury, getting hotels into uh, the enterprise investment scheme, uh, REITs for uh, uh, um, the tourism industry. You know, there are quite a lot of very concrete steps that a council of that sort, if they uh, identified some of the issues, uh, could go forward with. It, a lot of it is about political will and political commitment. Um, and at the moment, I think John was absolutely right. I don't see that, and it saddens me being a member of the coalition parties. James? Yeah, I, I was just going to say, I mean, I, I think the issue, whether it's in DCMS or not, is somewhat irrelevant. The most important thing is that government has a policy for tourism, and it is played out across every department, and I think that point was made earlier today. I think the other thing we should bear in mind is how seriously tourism is or isn't taken by constituency MPs. Um, and at the local level, that's very important, because government, I defer to... Uh, my two colleagues here who will know much better than I, but government will take uh, much more awareness of and, and, and will listen to issues if they're championed by constituency MPs. Mm. And I think we also have to make sure that the tourism agenda isn't just played out at a national level, it's played out at a local level. And in this day of localism, LEPs and so on and so forth, we have to be working hard to position tourism as an economic driver at the local level. And believe me, if you think it's a difficult job at a national level, it's an even more difficult job at a local level. Lord Lee. Yes, can I just, just follow that and, and link it up, if I, if I may? We are actually now, as an industry, going to come together, uh, and we're just in the early stages of putting together a major campaign that is really going to link tourism with the visitor economy and with hospitality as well. There are a number of individuals in this room uh, who have met, and we are planning to involve the whole industry in its broadest sense in a major campaign pre the next election, this is the important thing, pre the next election, to really make sure that there are specific manifesto commitments that the parties do give. There was nothing last time. And that is going to involve pressure being put on the parties nationally, those who are in charge of writing the manifestos, but also it's going to involve the local MPs themselves. And we're going to be asking the industry in those constituencies to involve and put pressure on those individual MPs and those candidates in their election addresses to say specific things about what I said before is the number one industry in more constituencies than any other single industry. So there is going to be a campaign that hopefully in the months to come you will become increasingly aware of. And, and as part of that, we will we'll hear this afternoon about uh, the, the big conversation and, and the BHA's ambitions uh, to, to a huge jobs drive, 300,000 jobs in the coming years. Could, could we as an industry go to the parties and say, work with us and we'll double that, we'll make 600,000 jobs? Let me jobs. just give you one specific example, if I may, that won't cost the government a penny. The industry calculate that if we move to double summertime, the tourism revenues would increase by three and a half billion pounds and would have an extra 80,000 jobs. Now, if jobs are the number one driver for the government, a move to double summer time would give a massive lift at no real financial cost to the Exchequer. James, we're, we're, we are running late, but um, you and I are both in the business of pr the promotion of, of the country, of, of, of this city. Uh, why, maybe I'm doing myself out of a job here, why are there so many uh, fragmented ways that we promote this, the, 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 uh, the UK, England. We've got Visit London, Visit England, Visit Britain, Visit Leeds. 
Is, is, are we joined up? Is this a sensible way of, of, of promoting our country, bringing bums on seats on planes into the country? I mean, or, I, or getting people to stay at home? Yeah, I mean, I, I, you, you make the point very well. Um, it is an abiding frustration that small pockets of money are being spent in crackerjack ways, mm. actually. Um, and we do our best at Visit England through a national strategy to try and conjoin that spending in a more coordinated fashion. We've been able to, fortunately, with the regional growth fund uh, monies that we've had, sustain a domestic campaign, the like of which we haven't been able to do for years. That is because we've got dual key funding. We can put some money on the table and say to these many destinations, you match it and we'll spend it in a coherent way. And really that's the only way of making sure you can orchestrate the industry to spend in, a co in, a, in I say, as a coherent manner. I do worry because I think um, we're all facing future budget cuts. Local authorities who have been supporters of the visit Leeds and the visit Manchester of this world will find it very difficult um, to contribute to those destinations in future. I do worry that further salami slicing of monies right across the piece will actually make that fragmentation worse and the noise less. So I'm afraid I don't have a great answer other than I think you know you need to work to a national strategy. We have a national framework. We work with Visit Britain internationally. They have an international framework. And it's, it, the challenge is to make sure all those small pieces of spending are behind those strategies. So, so how do we, again, thinking to other sectors, uh, to, I mean, the creative industries is an incredibly fragmented uh, sector. In fact, it may not even be a sector. Um, you go from film to design exactly. to... Uh, how, what do we learn from them? How do they overcome that fragmentation to, to, to get changes to the visa regime around entrepreneurs' visas, to get a very generous tax relief for, uh, for animation, for, for video games, etc.? Um, all very significant uh, achievements in the last couple of years. That's a very uh, complex question, but it's partly the strength of the brand. It's partly the fact that um, MPs, uh, ministers and so on, actually experience the creative industries uh, themselves and culture and the arts and so on. Um, and so it becomes more relevant to them. I mean, I was very struck by the title of the new pub campaign, It's Better Down the Pub. Well, maybe following up something that John said about local MPs and James as well, is that actually what we need to do is take the MPs down the pub uh, and, and, you know, brainwash them, basically. Uh, you know, you've got to absolutely get this in politicians' heads, that this is the third largest industry in this country. And I really don't think the penny's dropped yet. I think uh, uh, events like this, where people, in a sense, uh, uh, develop determination are so important, but we have to get out there and sell the message. Um, before Ufi cuts off my microphone, just quickly across the, 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 the panel, uh, what's one thing that you, if, when we, if we meet again this time next year, what's one thing that we could really uh, have achieved that we should be aiming for as an industry that would make a big difference? Who wants to kick off? Well, I will Lord kick me. off. What I would like to see this time next year, we'll be one year away from, probably from the general election, uh, is um, the industry in its broadest sense to be involved, already involved, uh, in a major campaign that is putting pressure on the political parties at national level and, as I've said, via local MPs and candidates uh, at the local level. And then, with that sort of pressure, with the real support of industry, and potentially we could mount a massive campaign when we think of the number of companies and the number of uh, employees in the widest industry. We could round, uh, mount a massive campaign that would really change things, and that's what I would like to see. Well, that's a macro level. I'd like to make a point on a micro level. Um, but firstly, I want to say something very confidential. I want to keep it inside the room, inside the four <laughs> rooms. Don't, don't let anybody else know this. Uh, but the weather in Spain and Italy and France is generally better than it is in the UK. <laughs> I, but don't let anybody else know that. Um, when you have that type of disadvantage to compete against those markets, you need to take the weight off. You need to allow us to compete on a level playing field. The one thing I would say is allow us to compete at the same rate of tax as France, Italy, Germany or Spain does, and then watch us grow, because we will grow very quickly after that. James? Um, well, you know, Dermot, it, it rains more in Rome than it does in London. Uh, I know it doesn't feel like that, but there we go. 
Um, I'd like us as a collective, as a collective, as an industry, and we are pretty disparate, um, and there are a number of businesses in this room, all of whom are very, very different, and even outside this room. I'd like us to be sure about the killer things that we have to achieve four or five killer things that we have to achieve and put our own personal prejudices to one side for once and get behind those and actually champion those across government. If we have those five or six things, and I genuinely believe that we have those in our national strategy, we need to make sure that everybody, every government, every prospective government, every local politician, every local authority, every business can actually get behind those and this time next year say, yeah, we're going to consistently support those. Uh, well, I agree with everything that's gone before, but I'm going to cheat. I think we should have a and have three um, uh, additional things. We need a hospitality and tourism council uh, between the industry and government. We need a cabinet committee, cross cabinet committee on uh, tourism and hospitality, and we actually need Chris Rodriguez on the board of UKTI to demonstrate that we have one of the great export industries. <laughs> I wonder whether Chris wants to do more, yet more board meetings. Six so. days a week? <laughs> okay, um, we, we should probably wrap up at that, at that point. Um, we've heard uh, a campaign, we've heard uh, around tax, uh, shared priorities as an industry, council cabinet uh, joining up uh, UK Trade and Investment, Visit Britain and the other uh, organisations. Um, there's many more things we could have discussed and, and would like to have discussed um, uh, around the assets with, uh, and how we make the most of that around the role of London as a, as a driver of growth. Um, unfortunately, we will have to do that over lunch, um, but I will hand back to Ufi and say thank you very much. <laughs>